Hey, let's say you're out in the woods in Upton, Massachusetts on a hike, right? Just walking along, enjoying the scenery, when you come across a weird hole in the side of a hill. Hmm. Your interest is piqued, so you get a little closer and realize it's not just a hole, it's the entrance to some kind of stone chamber, something clearly built by humans. Now, you look at this odd little chamber and you think, hey, I've seen one of these before. Yeah, just a couple weeks ago in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. A few miles south of here, you were doing the same thing, just screwing around out in the forest, and bam, another stone chamber. Hey, and in fact, a couple weeks before that, you were down south, just a few miles more in Sterling, Connecticut, just having the time of your life, running around in the woods like you always do. And guess what? Another chamber. Hmm. Seems like there's some research to be done about these guys, right? But first, though, why not check out this new chamber you just found yourself in front of? Dang, what a beautiful spot, right? Now you're really starting to wonder what's up with these chambers you keep finding. So you bust out your phone and you get to work. What's the story on these chambers? Well, the first thing you find out is that there are far, far more than just three of these guys. In fact, hundreds of these stone chambers have been found dotting the entire United States Northeast. New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, all over. In fact, a lot of them even have names. That one down in Sterling, that's the Aneco Stone Chamber. Uxbridge's is called the Snet Chamber, and hey, the one you're inside of right here in Upton shares the name of the town. It's the Upton Chamber. But what actually are they? Who built them, and why? Well, you find out pretty quick that those questions have a pretty simple answer. No one knows. The exact nature of these chambers has evaded archaeologists and historians for a long, long time. But that being said, there's certainly no shortage of theories. Some of them are a little wild, like the idea that these chambers were built by Europeans who came over to the Americas hundreds of years before Columbus, typically either the Vikings or Irish monks of some kind. You decide to look into that Irish monk theory first and learn that its only real argument lies in the architecture of the chambers. Similar chambers were built by the Irish back in Europe, with the most notable parallel being the use of something called corbeling. Corbeling, you wonder? Huh, what's that? Quick search tells you that corbeling is a technique used to build a curved stone wall in which rocks are stacked on top of one another to keep the wall sturdy as it bends. Well, this technique is super common in ancient architecture in the British Isles, it's pretty rare among Native American and colonial European construction. You find that the argument for the Vikings is pretty similar, although with a hair more plausibility simply because there's more evidence of the Vikings' presence in North America prior to Columbus's arrival. Now, while these arguments based around similar construction techniques are certainly cool, you learn pretty quick that most experts consider the idea that the Irish or Vikings built these structures to be pretty far-fetched. Mostly because of the total lack of supplemental artifacts or constructs found in or around the chambers. Basically, nothing else that can be traced to either the Irish or Norse has ever been found in any real capacity around these chambers. So the idea that they built literally hundreds of them miles and miles deep into the continent without leaving anything behind is usually not taken too seriously. Like, for example, the Vikings would have had to have landed in North America, taken a look around, and gone, all right, men, let's march ourselves hundreds of miles deep into these woods, build like 400 little huts, and then get the hell out of here forever. Hop to it. All right, so if the pre-Columbus European theory doesn't hold much weight with the experts, what does? Well, for the most part, the answer is pretty uniform. 
A little digging tells you the common consensus is that most of these little stone chambers are just artifacts from colonial farms and settlements. The most common theory is that they're root cellars, intended to keep crops like potatoes cool and fresh. Other explanations that get tossed around are animal pens, ice houses, and just general storage. You learn that there's a lot of evidence to support these ideas. The chambers are pretty similar to root cellars found in other parts of the world. They're often found close by other remnants of colonial settlements, and historians have even found illustrated records of colonial farmers using root cellars that line up very nicely to these stone chambers. Well, that about seals it, you think. You're sitting inside a colonial root cellar. Hey, but wait a minute, something's not right about that. The Upton chamber here looks quite a bit different from most of the other stone chambers you've seen and read about. Even setting aside its massive size, its shape really doesn't seem that practical for a root cellar, does it? Most of the others are just an entranceway into a similarly sized chamber, easy to move things in and out of. The Upton chamber, though, is gigantic on the inside with a comparatively small little entranceway. If this is a root cellar, why does it look so different from the others? You just gotta know, so you bust out your phone again and find out that the Upton chamber is actually quite famous for being so unique. Of the hundreds of chambers, this large dome style is quite rare. And even among the dome chambers, this one is extremely large. As you look and read, you find out that many other people, including plenty of experts, have asked similar questions too. Like if this is a colonial root cellar, how come it matches up so well with European descriptions of Native American ceremonial sweat lodges? And how come professional dating of the soil within the walls of the chamber says it could very easily be more than 600 years old? And how come, on the exact day of the summer solstice and no other time of year, the setting sun shines directly down through the entranceway, lighting up the chamber inside? And the water inside the chamber, why does it pool here so easily and so frequently? And can it be pure coincidence that on the day of the summer solstice, as the sun shines perfectly in through the entrance, that the presence of water in the chamber lengthens the effect, causing the sunset to brighten up the chamber for four times longer than it does when the chamber is dry? Now, as these questions start to pile up, you learn one last piece of information. At the top of nearby Pratt Hill, almost a mile away from the Upton Chamber, lie several stone cairns of unknown origin. So if this chamber is a root cellar, is it just pure happenstance, pure chance, that when researchers shined a strobe from the chamber to those cairns almost a mile away, that the line of light between the two pointed directly up towards the stars of the Pleiades constellations. I guess we'll just never know for sure. See you next time.